Can you start us? Good evening and welcome to Tell the Truth, the Tell It Slant, behind the scenes at Apple TV show Dickinson. I'm Leslie Morris, the Gore Vidal Curator of Modern Books and Manuscripts at the Houghton Library at Harvard University. It may seem unusual that a rare book and manuscript library, such as Houghton, should be holding a program about a TV series that is still being aired. Houghton uh, really has a more antiquarian air to many people. The connection is Emily Dickinson. Houghton is home to the largest collection of original Dick Dickinson artifacts in the world. The core of the collection came to Harvard in 1950, the gift of Gilbert Montague, a Harvard alum who was a distant relative of the Dickinson. The library is home to manuscripts of more than a thousand of Dickinson's poems and more than 300 of her letters to family and friends. The poet's beautiful herbarium which she created when she was a student at Amherst Academy. The family library, including some books that were marked by the poet, and the Dickinson Room, which you can see behind me, which includes such iconic pieces as the small table and chair at which she wrote much of her poetry, and the chest of drawers in which her sister Lavinia discovered the manuscripts of the poems after Dickinson's death. All of this is freely available to you in digitally at our website to inspire your own creativity, whether it be in poetry, in art, or as is the case this evening, in film. But the library not only collects original manuscripts by Emily Dickinson, we also collect selectively material that we feel has cultural resonance in illuminating the the inspiration Dickinson can bring to contemporary issues. That's why we're here this evening. From its earliest stages of development, Apple TV's Dickinson has shown both attention to historical detail, you'll see reproductions of Houghton materials throughout the episodes, and their own creative twist on that history. We're delighted that Alina Smith and her colleagues have chosen to gift the production archive for Dickinson to Houghton Library, including scripts, costume designs, tone books, and selective props. I have no doubt that this archive will inspire students and scholars in finding and developing their own version of Emily Dickinson. Christine Jacobson, Assistant Curator of Modern Books and Manuscripts here at Houghton, was the person who first suggested that this acquisition happen and who's been shepherding it through the acquisition process. So now I'll turn things over to Christine. Thank you, Leslie. Um, I just have a few items of housekeeping before I introduce our speakers tonight. Um, first is that one month from today, Houghton Library is hosting its annual birthday party for Emily Dickinson um, virtually on Zoom, and you're all invited. Um, we have a great lineup of poets and artists this year who, whose work has been inspired by Emily Dickinson, including former poet laureate Tracy K. Smith. Um, my colleague Michael is going to put a link to um, register for that event in the chat, and I hope that you will come. Uh, there will be about a 15 minute Q&A toward the end of the webinar. So we invite you to submit your questions using the Q&A um, function. If you put them in the chat, our moderator may not see them. Um, so if you have questions about how to do that, uh, please do reach out in the chat. We've got staff standing by um, to help you. And so without further ado, our moderator this evening is Deidre Lynch. Deidre Lynch is Harvard's Ernest Birnbaum Professor of Literature and Director of Undergraduate Studies. She has authored and co-edited numerous works, most recently the unfinished book, Oxford 21st Century Approaches to Literature, as well as several works on Jane Austen and literary culture. Her scholarly work examines the intersection of fan culture and literature 
themes very close to the phenomenon of Dickinson, making for just one of many reasons uh, we're lucky to have her moderating this evening. Thank you, Deidre. Jennifer Moeller is costume designer and an alumna of the Yale School of Drama. She has designed costumes for over 60 stage productions, including for the Shakespeare Theater Company, the Public Theater, and Juilliard, among many others. Her work has been nominated for the Helen Hayes Award in Outstanding Costume Design three times, and she is a frequent collaborator of the two-time Pulitzer Prize winner, Lynn Nottage, including for Nottage's newest play, Clyde's on Broadway. She is, of course, the principal costume designer behind the period confections worn by the cast of Dickinson and authoress of the clothing item I covet most in this world, the beautiful gold and navy plaid housecoat Haley Steinfeld wears in season two, episode eight, I'm nobody, who are you? Marina Parker is a set decorator who studied architectural restoration before going on to work in documentaries and television. She has six producer and assistant producer credits and has served as a set decorator for 13 television series. These include the lived-in wood-paneled interiors of The Good Cop, the mid-century sparseness of Errol Morris's miniseries about MK Ultra, Wormwood, and of course the stunning interiors of the Dickinson homestead, Sue and Austin's 19th century chic evergreens, the period accurate printing floor of the Springfield Republican, and so much more in Apple TV's Dickinson. In an interview for the Set Decorators of America, Marina defined beauty as something you recognize when it rushes through you. And I look forward to hearing about which objects and spaces from the show have given her that rush. Elena Smith is a playwright and TV writer, an alumna of the Yale School of Drama. Uh, Elena has written critically acclaimed plays and served as a writer and producer for Showtime's The Affair and HBO's The Newsroom. She is also the creator, showrunner, and executive producer of the Peabody award-winning Apple TV show, Dickinson. This season marks her directorial debut. Elena directed the three finale episodes of the show coming out later this winter. Oh, sorry, the finale episode, I'm sorry about that. The New Yorker has described Dickinson as something that had climbed, quote, from the brain of a woke English grad student on an acid trip, and the New York Times hailed it as, quote, heady, funny, and full feeling, dead serious about its subject, yet unserious about itself. I think these two reviews aptly describe not only the show, but also its wonderful creator. The other day, Elena tweeted, never before in history has there been such a powerful community of nerdy, passionate, detail-oriented women as the Dickinson audience. And as a member of that community, I want to thank you for creating such a sensational show. So thank you, Jennifer, Marina, and Elena for spending time with us this evening. And with that, I'm very happy to turn things over to Professor Deidre Lynch. Thank you, Christina. And thank you for, for kind of um, uh, inviting me to participate in this very exciting event. As um, Christine said, I work on the intersections of literary history and femme culture, which means I can unabashedly say that kind of my scholarly interests are based on my own fandom. And I am just kind of uh, really excited to, to, to get to talk about Dickinson, which has brightened up uh, uh, the last couple of years in all sorts of ways. Um, so I guess I, I will start with, with kind of what a lot of us knew about Dickinson before the show. The one thing that everybody knows about Emily Dickinson and people who've never read a word of her poetry know this as well is that she wore a white dress and she was kind of an agoraphobic hermit who never ventured beyond the walls of her bedroom. And I think for better and for worse, this has for many 21st century readers being an emblem of what it means to be a woman writer in the 19th century, or at least a white woman writer. You're gonna be unworldly, domestic, virginal, a little bit crazy. Uh, how does Dickinson both build on and revise that image? How did you recreate that bedroom? How did it change? I, I would love to hear that from, from all of you, I think. Um, 
Well, thank you so much, Deidre, and thank you, Christine and Leslie, and we're so excited to be here. And um, I'm so excited to be here in particular with Jen and Marina, because these uh, two women have just given so much of themselves and their own heart and soul and aesthetic and emotional life to Dickinson over the past three seasons. And I just treasure them both so much as artists and the collaborator, the collaborations that we've had have just, just been some of the absolute pinnacle of my own enjoyment of making the show. Um, so thank you guys too, for being here. And um, I think, so to go, you know, to this question of, um, you know, what people knew or thought they knew about Emily Dickinson, you know, part of what inspired me to write the show was reading a lot of fabulous Dickinson scholarship that existed before I made the show that was all about disrupting that received notion of her. And, you know, kind of saying, well, the whole story about her as this recluse in a white dress who never left her room, it was really trumped up by her first editors as a way to sell books. It was an exaggeration, or even if it was true, it was really only true more towards the very end of her life. And Dickinson lived a long life into her 50s. Um, and, you know, the period of time that really captivated me was her youth, which as it was written about in that, you know, in a number of biographies, but particularly this biography by Alfred Haybegger, My Wars Are Laid Away in Books, really showed her as this mischievous, rebellious, sometimes rude, um, always ironic, uh, uh, like kind of a little like shit kicker. Um, and not, not in a white dress, you know? I mean, the white dress wouldn't even have been a white dress of that particular style, because of course you can go to the museum, the homestead, and see a replica of the white dress, or Jen, maybe, I don't know if it is the real thing or a replica of, of it. It's a replica, currently. Right. And you know that a dress like that wouldn't even have been made in the 1850s. So so to to go back and to say, well, what's, what's really underneath this? And what I found and what inspired the show was Emily Dickinson as a passionate queer rebel who took every last scrap of agency she had um, and, and used it to build a body of work that while she never showed it to people in the way that, you know, we might today with social media and, you know, th that sort of thing, like she, she certainly knew that she was building something that, that, you know, um, was going to be her legacy and that she would devote like all of her, all the, all of her energy towards over her whole life. So, um, yeah, so I guess we can we should talk about, you know, but so like in terms of approaching Dickinson, the 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 show was always like what's the myth and what's the truth, but also more importantly, like how can we find the detail about the truth, the truth of the period, the truth of Dickinson that is both accurate but also like unexpectedly disruptively relevant to today. And um you know, we're, we have about a million different examples of how we did this in both the production and set design and the costume design. But um, I guess, why don't we just start with the dress and kind of talk about, about all of our associations around it. I mean, I think the very first thing was like, we knew that our Emily wasn't really going to be in that white dress. And in fact, wasn't really even going to be in white. Um, so we put her in white in the first episode but it's not the same as the white dress. It's a different kind of dress. And then we, and then we don't see her in white again um, for, for all of season one, at least. So anyway, Jen, I'll hand it over to you to say things about the dress. Sure. Well, you know, that first season, which was designed by John Dunn, um, so beautifully by John Dunn, was started off with, I think, what was an homage to that, to that white dress. You know, when you go to the Dickinson homestead, it's one of the only pieces of clothing that are there that exist, I believe, from, from her. Um, and so I think that was a sort of a little nod to that. And then the rest of the season, as Elena said, sort of moved moved past, past it. And, it, and again, you know, it, it also, um, that first dress 
it, it's white, it's muslin, it's similar, I think, in a lot of ways to, to the white dress, but it is of an earlier period, very much referring to the, that, that single image, real, the real photograph of Emily, which is, think, is from when she was a, I don't know, 16, 17 year old, something yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. The style is of that earlier era of the 1840s. Um, and then we have tons of fun and we have color and, and red dresses and blue well, velvet dresses. And by the, by the time, I mean, not to, no spoilers, but in a certain sense where we're going in season three, we, we kind of come to a place where it's like, this whole show has been Emily Dickinson's origin story. And if she's a superhero, like her costume has to be that white dress. So it's almost like once we get her into that white dress, she's become, she's become the Emily Dickinson of, of legend. Sure. And part of the project of the whole show is kind of getting her there. But we obviously begin like as far away from that as possible. And we were all about exploding a world that we tend to picture in black and white or in very subdued tones into huge color and pattern. And that that is a good segue into, you know, Marina as well, because definitely like so we took the whole homestead, you know, the our production designer for season one, Lauren Weeks, like went and visited the homestead and looked at, you know, actual blueprints from the 1800s. And we had a set that replicated the exact dimensions of the rooms, but how we decorated those rooms, we, we went like hard psychedelic instead of, um, you know, some kind of sedate museum rep replica of her life. But we were also being truthful to the period, right? Because Marina, you can talk about like the wallpaper. Um, yeah, absolutely. We, um, so I had never worked in the 1800s before in that time period. And I hadn't worked, I'm, I'm not from New England. I'm from Northern California where there is very much not a strong Victorian presence. Um, so the research for me on this was um, challenging and exciting and fun, but it was a whole wormhole to go down. And like you said, the very first thing that we did, Lauren Weeks and I and Diana Schmidt, the producer, went up to Amherst to take a look at the museum. And um, that was incredibly helpful from an architectural standpoint. Um, most of the house was at that point pretty bare. Um, there wasn't a lot in terms of the decorative arts aspect. The room that was the most um, fully fleshed out was Emily's bedroom. And I think in many ways, Emily's bedroom is, we're, we're kind of the closest to the source material on Emily's Although bedroom. Although different in certain important ways that I hope we can get into, but yeah. Yeah, definitely. The, um, the desk, we tried to be, be very faithful about the desk, the scale of the desk, the look of the desk. We tried to, I think we did a good job getting very close on that. Um, her, she famously has that sleigh bed, which we did not use at all. We wanted a much smaller bed so that when Sue and Emily were in bed together, it was much more intimate. Um, and, also, and also to, I think, exaggerate the sense of her being like stuck in a little girl's life, even as she's getting to be an older person. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, we did not, the, the museum did has repl replicated wallpaper, which was, uh, I think, uh, found on a scrap when, and dated towards the end of her life. It's a little bit of a busier floral pattern, um, and it was later than our time frame anyway. So we chose um, a wallpaper called New England Floral, which is similar in tone in that it's a floral pattern. It feels like it could have been picked out by her parents for her. There's a sweetness to it, but it's also, I mean, one of the things that I really like about it is that it has a lyricism to it. It has a little bit of movement. It has negative space. It breathes, um, and it feels, it feels like it speaks to to her. There's a real loveliness to that wallpaper. Um, and so and Marina would would do like we would just have the most amazing conversations about you know okay, this isn't a museum, this is a real person's bedroom now, our character of Emily who's living in this room. And so Emily is always out taking long walks in nature and coming home with weird fossils and plants and antlers and bones. And we would have those strewn around the room or on the mantelpiece. And then we also had like artwork tacked to the wall that would change from season to season as Emily. So I remember one really important distinction between season one and season two was that, in season one, she was trying to, to claim the right to be an artist. And in, in season two, she had 
she had basically gotten that room of one's own. And I said that I wanted season two, Emily's bedroom to feel like an artist's studio that she, you know, once she does shut that door, no one does come in. And so there was more books in there. There were, it, it got a little more serious. And then, and then in season three, we started to bring in elements of the war that's going on. So there's like a, a handkerchief with an American flag that she has tied to her bookshelf next to her desk. And also images of mermaids, that is an important um, uh, thing that we'll get to in season three. Um, and, you know, we always, we would have so much fun talking about like, you know, well, Marina would say, do you, would you want this painting over her bed and, and making these like really reading and Jen as well, like, like reading, they both, these, the, you guys would both read the script so closely and then come up with objects. And sometimes you would also just come up with objects that were so great. And then I would find a way to put them in the script, you know, because we wanted to be able to use the beautiful things um, and they would spark ideas. And I mean, the, the research, like we would always be like sharing, it was like we were building a big collage out of all this research, so. Well, it was one of the really fun things that we did in season one and one of the ways in which we showed her progression from being um, younger to more serious and focused on the writing. But we found um, that Victorians did these insane like nuts, bananas, photo collages of just like psychedelic trippy photo like collage. Like a duck with a man's head and like, you know, a butterfly with weird eyes on the wings and, and <laughs> um, around like a couch. And it was all just like bored women in the 19th century piecing, piecing things together. But it felt like something you would see on Tumblr today. It felt so modern. It felt so contemporary. Yeah. It felt, it felt in the it way like Dada that, before there was Dada, like, yes, yeah. yeah, in the way that Emily's language feels so far ahead of its time, those images, when I saw them felt so far ahead of their time. And it felt like a visual way to express how advanced she was, but it also it turns out it was one of those things that we unearthed as we were doing research that the parallels, the resonance to now, it's, um, it's crazy how contemporary it feels and how modern and cool and fresh um, but it's also rooted in historical fact. These things right. existed. Women and these collages, as soon as Marina brought me that, I, I really like lit up and, and they ended up being part of what inspired our main title sequences, which also are these kind of Victorian photo collage, which are, you know, we have unique main title designs for each episode. And so the way that that would work is we worked with this company called Shine Studio and I would Put, give them a list of images that were important in any given episode and then they would find sourced you know Victorian kind of collage objects and put it together into this like herky-jerky funny kind of um you know little little then and the eclipse symbol is the one thing that remains consistent throughout so the eclipse is kind of like the symbol of the whole show um we did some but, also, these collages reminded me of something I saw at the museum that blew my mind the first time I visited there, um, which was when I was writing the pilot of Dickinson, which was in like 2015, I went and visited the museum to just sort of commune with her spirit and get inspired um, to get her blessing on this project, I guess. And, um, and in the Evergreens, Sue and Austin's house next door to the homestead, which is a very creepy, spooky, gothic house. Um, upstairs, there is a nursery room, which is definitely the spookiest room in the whole house because Sue and Austin's child died, and it's it's just a it's just a very haunted sort of space. Um, but in that room, there is a door where there's just a whole collage of newspaper cutouts and paper dolls and pictures from magazines that Sue and Austin's kids cut out and pasted on the door. It's still the original. It's from 1870s and 80s probably is when that got made. So I mean, that's was amazing to me because that's what my bedroom looked like when I was growing up. And, you know, just I think I think the idea of collage is like extremely important to the entire construction of Dickinson as we are combining so many elements that like don't seem like they would go together um, from the music to the costumes to the guest stars to literary figures who didn't actually really meet Emily Dickinson in, in real life, but were but but meet her all the time in the literary canon, right? 
and and we are dramatizing a literary canon as much as we are dramatizing an actual period. Um, so yeah. So one of the things that that I just love about the show is that you're both emancipating Emily Dickinson from the 19th century, showing all the ways in which she's our contemporary, but you're also showing us that in all sorts of ways that we have forgotten the 19th century was ahead of, of, of its time as well. And I think this, it, I think that your ability to do this bespeaks your inc the incredible amount of research that has gone into the show. I mean, just, just so that people know what has arrived at the Houghton. I, I, I went in last week and, you know, there are reams and reams of the scripts of kind of the tone books, the costume designs, the architectural blueprints for the, 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 the sets. And the thing that kind of just amazed me as well, the props that are the actual papery poems. Um, so that kind of though Emily Dickinson's manuscripts with the original manuscripts, which are at the Houghton are like too delicate for us to handle. There is a way in which I, much more than kind of when I look at them digitized, which is all I'm allowed to do, um, or look at photographs of them, I really got a sense of, of kind of her medium and the, 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 the kind of paper creations that she was making as she kind of uses scraps of poems, uh, uh, scraps of envelopes uh, to, to write her poems as she sews the poems together. It's really, really splendid. And one of the things I, I, I wanted to, to kind of um, uh, raise is that the other incredibly admirable thing that, that the show does is it shows, it demonstrates that Dickinson is writing at this totally crucial moment in the history of African-American literature in the United States as well. And without kind of giving away too much ab ab about season three, since only three episodes have dropped, um, can you say more about kind of Henry, the abolitionist newspaper that, that he is running in, in kind of season two in Austin Dickinson's barn? Since I think that that was for me, one of the thrills of, mm -hmm. of kind of the, the the scripts that you've created. Well, the really nice thing about going into season three is that whereas in season two, we really made up that whole story about Henry and the abolitionist journal based on some research that I, you know, found um, uh, that that was about that type of work that was being done underground by African American writers and activists. And, and we sort of um, imagined a world where Henry could have been running such a thing out of Austin's barn with Austin's participation as, as patron. Um, in season three, we actually get to encounter a completely true story, an amazing story from history that is that I knew, I mean, when I pitched the show, I knew that we were going to have, you know, three seasons where a third season would go into the Civil War because the Civil War is Emily's most um, prolific time as a poet. It's where she really comes into her own. And um, she becomes that that superhero, Emily Dickinson. And um, uh, I knew that one of the most significant events from a biographical perspective is that she writes her very first letter to Thomas Wentworth Higginson, who is a really important figure in his own right in history. He is a radical um, abolitionist minister who in the Civil War is basically being part of a kind of like Occupy movement in the South where he and some other white abolitionists have gone and um, liberated a plantation um, not with without without any without the consent of Lincoln or the federal government and they have basically gone in and said okay all the people who were enslaved in this plantation are now um, going to be paid to do the labor and it's basically going to turn into a kind of work camp and also we're going to um, make these black men into union soldiers but it still is in this kind of like murky middle ground because um, there hasn't been an emancipation proclamation they're doing this against the the wish of the of, of Lincoln and I mean it's so funny because this group of soldiers is called the first South Carolina volunteers but of course they're fighting for the union and so I I think it's so interesting because like that whole name is ironic in a way um 
but Emily writes a letter to Higginson. Emily, who sees an essay that Higginson has written in the Atlantic magazine called Letter to a Young Contributor, um, in which he encourages young poets to reach out to him for writing advice. Um, she just like cold emails him, sends him a letter, which reaches him in Beaufort, South Carolina on this former plantation that's now an, an occupied Union Army regiment. And um, writes to him and says, you know, can you tell me if my poems are any good? And this begins what turns into a 24 year long um, co writing correspondence between them. And ultimately Higginson becomes her first editor. So he is responsible for making Emily, Dick he's one of the people most responsible for making Emily Dickinson known. Um, so I knew when I pitched the show that we would get to meet Higginson and that he would be with this group of black soldiers um, you know, in this fascinating, complicated situation of, you know, f fighting for their own liberation, you know, in, in the earlier part of the Civil War. Um, and sort of how would you pull the Dickinson trick of taking something that is true and is rooted in history, but doing a translation of it into what does that mean for us today? What does that mean? Who, what are the voices of these soldiers? Who are these people, right? And, um, and that was incredibly exciting. And, and sort of like us, um, we, had, we had done a version of it with our abolitionist literary magazine. Um, and, but the, this one was not only more true to history, but also more true to the facts of what led us to to know about Emily. And, and it's so fascinating to me that this person who seems, Emily, who seems to be so cloistered from the war, writes to somebody who's literally on the front lines and who is a revolutionary. Um, and, that, and that she picks that person is, is very interesting. So that was one thing. That's really fascinating. Yeah, yeah. I wanna ask just because- And you guys, I'll say to any fans who are here, you guys will meet those soldiers this week because they, First, and, and we meet Higginson in episode four, which is comes out on Thursday, Friday, depending what time time zone you're in. <laughs> that, 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 that's excellent. I, yeah. I, I can't wait. I think Hig a lot of Higginson's papers are at the Houghton as well. <laughs> um, so kind of all roads lead, lead to the um, Houghton Library as I have often found to, to be the case. So there's so much research. And I guess one of the things that I'm really interested in would be, are there moments when you didn't, are there things that you found out that you weren't able to use as you kind of, you know, went to museums, looked at kind of the history of wallpaper production and rug production. I know that you've done all of that. What are the things, what are the discards that, that you still have a little bit of regret about, or maybe you were able to, to, to kind of put everything in there. I mean, the, the sets in particular, there's such plenitude, but, but I imagine, uh, Marina, that there were things that you ended up leaving, leaving out or? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, for sure, we were up against the constraints of time as is the case in, in working in television. And so the first couple of, like, for instance, I was shocked to learn that wall-to-wall -wall carpeting was a thing in the 1850s. I thought that was 1950s for sure, but it was really practical because floorboards were irregular and draft would come in and dust would come in. And so people had, had carpet everywhere. We were just incredibly lucky to find this company in Red Lion, Pennsylvania, who had been for generations using these looms and making these carpets. Um, the first call I made about those things, you know, they said, well, that'll easily be nine months at the, that a rush job would be nine months. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure. What about the silk wallpaper of the evergreens and how we ended up re sort of recreating it? We, we, we couldn't afford the French silk that we wanted for the walls. And so you, what did you do, Marina? That was like your brilliant move. <laughs> well, I think Jamie Moore, assistant set decorator, found this place um, that was willing to silk screen fabric for us. Um, we also, the, the DP wanted it to be a little bit lighter. We liked the idea of some darkness and flowers blooming out of the darkness, uh, but it needed to read on camera too. It just didn't want to be in a black box. Um, so 
we had the graphic designer kind of work off of a pattern that we liked and manipulate it. And then we had a silk screen made and we had fabric printed. And that way we were able to control the base colors so that it was a bit brighter. Actually, um, another example of something we didn't get to do is the nursery. We didn't, we didn't get to, ex just because of budget, because of production, we didn't get to expand our evergreens footprint as it were beyond the main parlor, the Austin study slash library and the Sue and Austin's bedroom, which interestingly was on the first floor, which is such a strange thing. It was um, considered chic to have the sort of the master bedroom on the first floor. And of, co and of course, Sue and Austin had to do everything that was chic. And, um, and they, and actually a pretty crazy story about that, that I found out the last time I was at the Dickinson Museum, which was just a few months ago, is that for a period of time later on, Austin was sleeping in that room with Mabel and Sue was sleeping upstairs with the kids. It's kind of so crazy these Dickinsons. Mabel Loomis Todd. Yeah. Is, yes. Yeah. Yeah. His, <laughs> his, his name is Loomis full Loomis. of foreboding. Yeah. 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 <laughs> to bring to bring us kind of back to the the dress. One of the things that I thought was going to be a discard was the white dress because it was so much later. It's a, it's a house dress from the seven late seventies early eighties. Um, but then in season three, which uh, the trailer is out, so you've seen some images, we did get to recreate that that dress, and so that was a was a really nice surprise. Yes. To and have I an object that I thought we could never use, um, and then we actually recreated it almost exactly, like using the original pattern, right? Yeah. So you know, the, the original dress was on loan to the Dickinson Museum for many years from the Amherst Historical Society, and at some point, I'm not sure when, it was given back, and a replica was made. And they and the museum commissioned um, a woman to take a pattern, carefully take a pattern off of the original dress. And they had a uh, company in England that made reproduction fabrics reweave the an exact replica of the fabric. Um, and we learned all this because I'd seen the dress there. And as soon as I found out that it was going to be in the in the series, I called Jane Wald, the, the director of the museum and um, asked about it. And, you know, she, that, that all this had happened before her tenure at the museum. So she, but she was happy to help. Um, and she went up to the attic and dig around in some boxes until she, cause everything there is just boxes in the attic um, and uh, found the contact information for this woman who took the pattern and we reached out to her and we got the, her copy of the pattern. Um, and then miraculously, when we reached out to the company um, in England who had woven the fabric 20 years ago, they had a small stash of it left. Um, seven yards, which we were afraid wasn't gonna be enough because typically we get about 10 yards for a dress, but this is later period. Uh, and we did make a couple of tweaks just to make, so we could eke it out, but um, it's it's as accurate as um, as possible. And you know, our time, uh, you, know, you know, we're doing this so quickly. Um, I never thought that that was gonna be possible. So that was pretty. That's amazing. Okay, so now I have to change tack. And I, I mean, I am a professor of English and American literature, so I have to ask about poems <laughs> um, uh, is my responsibility. And I just want to ask you kind of each, each of you, if you want, like what are the poems that kind of have stuck in your head during, during these years in which you've worked on the show? What are the ones that you, what are the poems of Dickinson's that you keep coming back Can to? Can I say one more research story real quick? Oh, of course, yes. yeah. yeah. Just to say another really wonderful, for me, discovery uh, or, or something that was um, when, okay, so I knew that Emily's science teacher had been this man, Edward Hitchcock. Um, and Edward Hitchcock's wife, Aura Hitchcock, O-R-R-A, um, made, worked with him very closely and did, and drew text, science textbooks of his. And basically, the, it, it actually was a complete coincidence that right when we were making season one, there was an Aura Hitchcock show at the American Folk Art Museum, I think, of a lot of, but I know that at Amherst Library, they have um, uh, original drawings of Aura Hitchcock's in their collection, and because he was at Amherst, he was the, one, you know, he was a trustee, her, her husband, Edward. And one, when we did, when we go to our, um, we, in episode two of season one, when Emily and Sue sneak into the lecture about volcanoes at the college, and a very ridiculous uh, parody of Edward Hitchcock as a kind of 
pervy science teacher is um, is doing his thing. Uh, um, we had a reproduction of an actual Aura Hitchcock um, drawing diagram of a volcano. And it's just beautiful. And it's like, it's just another example of artwork made by women of the time that is so stunning and feels so fresh and like you'd want it hanging on your wall now. Um, and yeah, and uh, that I just I just wanted to shout out Aura Hitchcock because you should go yeah. look at all her drawings because they're they're beautiful. There's so many women we've forgotten. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that that's right. Okay, so the one that we haven't forgotten poems that 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 have retained their staying power for you over over the course of this project. What do you, you want to mention? Any? The daisy follows soft the sun. I think that one was one. It was a special episode and yeah yeah that is an amazing episode in season two right yeah 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 and just to talk about costumes for that episode like I remember Jen and I having a kind of aha moment when we realized that you know we really needed to put Emily in something that was going to pop in that hedge maze that we that we had her running around in most of which was totally VFX um but you know it actually looked like a kind of crappy Christmas tree farm on set, but, um, <laughs> but got pumped up after the fact um, into something very beautiful. But, and then, and having her wearing a dress that I think has like yellow flowers on it. So she, she's becoming, she's becoming Sam's mm. Daisy. You know, that's part of the story that we're telling with that dress. We we'll always start with the poem, we, we, you know, with each one and, and especially with Emily's clothes. I just start there and I'm always looking at that poem that's, that's really fascinating the, or the clues into what the color should be or the textures or the shape um it's definitely very but they're very aligned i think because jen and i went to drama school together we automatically were i mean we were trained together in a system which said everything every physical aspect of production helps tell the story and so you know we thought holistically like that. And because I always had all the scripts written ahead of production, we were all able to approach it like that. And I think that, you know, we we shared like the the three of us shared like a joy of specificity that, you know, we were always under a huge amount of pressure due to time and budget. Um, but we we were so, you know, uh, artistically inspired by the details. Right. It was also right. so lovely that every episode was kind of inspired by or shaped around a poem. So it was so nice to sit with that poem, like read the poem first, read the script, have it kind of seeping into your brain as you started to think about um, the ways to execute all of these elements that was yeah. really nice and on the poem tip like this is much more mechanical but we had a scenic whose middle name was Emily and she'd been named after Emily Dickinson and she for a while did the handwriting and she like dove deep into it and um it was really wonderful like she noticed as Emily got excited her handwriting would change and get messier and more scrawly and then there were moments like you, you could feel the emotion in the actual script and um and and just to say too like our our you know someone who's not here but was amazingly important in this production is our vfx designer lada another woman uh who helped contribute to the making of this project and i remember going you know lada and i worked together to design the handwriting of emily's that actually shows up on the screen and of course we were you know original like I you know we're, we knew that Emily's handwriting changes over her life and what period were we going to use and how and where were we going to land with that but also the most important aspect of that handwriting is that it like it's like it's written in fire it's written in smoke um you know and and we and and I mean even down to like we would adjust the color in post we would adjust the color of of that handwriting in different scenes and I mean one of my most exciting moments honestly was when it's that scene where Emily is performing her poem fame is a fickle food for Sam standing outside and it's that beautiful just sunset that rosy pink and I was like can we make this 
rosy pink? Can we make the, can we make it not gold? Can we make it rosy gold? And, and, and Lada's like, oh, absolutely. And then, and then we, you know, and so sometimes it's blue and sometimes it's red and sometimes, and just that idea that it's alive in that way of her handwriting on the screen. Yeah, that's, that's great. I mean, I love the handwriting because I, I, I just love how kind of seriously you take manuscript in this show and how seriously you take the fact that Emily Dickinson's a poet of handwriting, not a poet of, 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 of printed books um, mm -hmm. and kind of the, the materials you've donated to the Houghton make that so clear. So I'm going to turn to, to some of the, the, many questions in, in the uh, Q&A. Um, I'm not going to be able to kind of uh, 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 purvey all of them, but um, I'm going to try to coordinate some of them. So it's so what's been so interesting is, is kind of hearing about what a collaborative process this has been for all of you. Um, and there is a question, of course, about kind of the, the role the actors play in that collaboration. So there's definitely a Haley Steinfeld uh, a fan in the group who wants to hear about kind of, you know, what say did she have in costumes? Did, did kind of the actors in the show kind of participate in, in decisions about sets and costumes? And if so, could you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. At least in my world, definitely. You know, I mean, it, it's, it's, it, they're, these are period clothes. They're not, it's not like jeans and t-shirts where people have a lot of opinions, a lot more opinions. Um, but I definitely worked very closely with Haley. Um, just you, you, we lay out the, the arc for the season and see how the fabrics worked. You know, it, the robe, which everybody um, uh, likes to, to talk about, the one from when she's invisible. Um, that was one where I had a couple of really good options and I couldn't decide, you know, which, which one. And I just held them up and I said, Haley, which one? And she, you know, immediately went to the one that we used and, and, it, and it was perfect. And, and that is actually her favorite costume. Because she doesn't have to wear a corset. Because she didn't have to wear a corset. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. That's, that, that's really great. So, I mean, another another set of comments involves um, what what kind of one questioner has, has said. There's lots of kind of hot topic social issues and kind of, I, I mean, I think there are two questions. How did you handle the queer romance and was there any pushback uh, to the way that you made the relationship between Emily Dickinson and, 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 and Susan Gilbert Dickinson so central to kind of Emily Dickinson's creativity? And I just, just kind of, what do you say? This is a question from somebody named Julie Hartman. What do you say to the criticism that Dickinson is trying to be too woke? <laughs> I've never heard that criticism. Um, uh, oh, I, my, the criticism actually has come the other way. It says, why aren't Emily and Sue having sex in every episode all the time from the start of the episode to the end of the episode? And I have to remind uh, people that, you know, we try to stick to a TV 14 rating and also that we um, have interests in Emily Dickinson and her life and times that actually go beyond her relationship with Sue, um, which a lot of, you know, it's a half hour show and we have, a, we barely have the real estate for everything we want to cram in there. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I, I, it's funny. It's funny because, um, you know, at our premiere, which was the other night, um, we, for season three, we were, blessed beyond words to have um, Amanda Gorman there. And that was actually in some part due to a connection made through the Houghton because we were part of Emily's birthday last year together. And, um, and, 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 and her being such a, a fan of the show. And, and I saw standing right next to Amanda, a person who like, you know, I happen to know is a cop and probably a Trump supporter. And he was going on about how much he loves the show. So I don't think that, you know, we, I don't, I think uh, there are many ways into Dickinson. And I think that Dickinson is a complicated portrait of American life right now that um, doesn't ever play it safe. And that's what I'm really proud of. And it was, it was, you know, I'm, I'm so proud that our whole team was, was brave enough, um, you know, to, to be vulnerable and to have difficult conversations because to me that's 
that's sort of the, the best version of what this is, you know. Other questions are like, how, how do you stage, what, what is the research that you did into kind of queer sexualities of the 19th century and also kind of how are, how are set design and, and costume design sort of advancing that story? I don't know if kind of Marina and, and Jen, you wanna take that on or Elena, you wanna talk about, about kind of what, what you read, um, I mean, I think I think the, the just I would just say that in in terms of the actual literal people that made the show and the crew, you know, we made every effort in the world to have um, as many people who were involved in the making of this show um, be, you know, female, non non binary, um, you know, like from every, you know, we we it is rare even in 2021 to walk onto a set and not see mostly dudes. And when you walked onto a set or when you were in a production meeting for Dickinson, it was largely not dudes. And the dudes that were there were awesome because they were willing to be supportive of a feminist vision. Um, and I, I'm, I think that we all, I mean, as Marina and Jen were department heads, they are responsible for hiring their own crews. And so the thought that they put into that was significant. Um, there's, I, I, oh, go there's, ahead. There's some stuff coming up in this season that would be fun for me to talk about, but I can't right now. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. No, no. Um, uh, um, I guess only kind of people, people, go ahead, Marina. Sorry. I think the only, it's kind of a tough question because we were sort of basing their environments around them sort of as holistic people, but the only specific example that comes to mind is something that just surfaced recently on Twitter that I'd almost forgotten about, which was the, um, the portrait of Mount Vesuvius, the volcano in Sue's room. And that was, and, and there's actually also a small print in, in Emily's room. And that was obviously an allusion to the second episode of the first season and, and a metaphor on some level for sexuality and exploring sexuality. But even more than that, it was like the, really about the language of intimacy that had been developed specifically between Sue and Emily and that kind of like coded language that was just theirs and theirs alone. Um, so it was really nice that someone noticed that. That is really great. Yeah. Um, there are people who want to know favorite costume, Jen? Oh, I, 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 I. They're all, they're all, it's so much love and, 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 and craftsmanship and attention to details and antique buttons and it goes into every single one. I, I remember there was like a time when Jen just came like, cause my office was on one floor and Jen was like right above me. And Jen would come running down and be like, Elena, I found antique buttons that look like acorns. And I'd be like, ah! <laughs> like put them on something, you know, like, and then we never, I don't think we ever used those acorn buttons. We never used them. Uh, we never but, you know. um, so it was, it was, it was always like that. It was so much fun. You know, I think I remembered something I was going to say was that Emily's I should say that like part of what made me think I could make this into a TV show is the fact that this woman always lived at home. And, you know, I knew that fundamentally like TV shows, they're about families. They take place in one stage. Now, our line producer would be laughing so hard if she heard me say this because I was always saying, guys, it's really small. This is our smallest season. And then we would end up doing the most insane things like war hospitals and battlefields and infernos and, and all the things that are to come in this season. But um, but 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 basically there was a location which was Emily's house and em Emily works at home and lives at home and loves at home and cooks at home and does everything at home. And, um, and, and sort of like, no matter what happens in any given day, she ends up like back Back in that bed or back at that desk, you know? Um, and I, I do feel like we made our own little dollhouse of the homestead and we would, we were just having so much fun running around in the dollhouse, like m positioning things. And, and of course, like the, the biggest moment of that was a, um, 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 a scene that happens in the finale of the series, which is the episode that I directed. And I won't go into too much detail about it because you guys will all see it. It's going to be on Christmas Eve, but um, we really kind of 
enter this like meditative space where Emily's room almost becomes like a diorama. And the specificity of how, of the details and how we were working with Marina and Jen and Lada and Haley and me and, um, and our, and our DP and our props person and just kind of like quietly talking through like, okay, where is the bonnet going to go and where, and which flowers are in the room now, because what season is it? You sort of see the seasons change and the flowers and, um, you know, everyone being so attuned to the details and the meaning of those details because that's what Emily was you know she she is nothing it, poems are nothing but details you know like uh why did she choose one word over another you know um so yeah that's wonderful so I think the last question is a question that that maybe Christine and 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 Leslie can answer best which is like when are the materials that have been given to the Houghton going to be available for for visitors to the Houghton to see that was that's a question in 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 the Q&A and I wonder whether one of you can kind of tell people about that you'd have to be unmuted, of course. Sure, but, yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> they're already available. We are still waiting on a few more items. Um, and right now they're only minimally processed, but I'm happy to put a link to the finding aid in the chat. Um, Elena, Marina, do you wanna talk about a few of the things that are still yet to come our way? Marina, you can describe what you're working on, yeah. Um, so I'm working on a basically large form scrapbooks, which felt very Emily Dickinson appropriate <laughs> in the vein of the herbarium, that um, there's one about the evergreens and one about the homestead. And um, they've got sa samples of the wallpapers and the fabrics and the carpet so that you can really see them, how they shine, what their texture is, um, and anecdotes at kind of showing as much as it's tough to show process uh, two-dimensionally on a page, but, but showing like the ratty sofa that we found that became the centerpiece of the evergreens parlor and the fabric we upholstered it in and, and the path that it took and then sort of how it ended up. Um, so hopefully that will be a little bit of insight into, um, yeah, the, the, the process. And Jen, can you, there's, there's a book with the costumes and kind of fabric samples as, as well. Can, can you say something about, about that? Oh, about I'm sorry I was the the, the book with the I'm fabric sorry. samples and we have gloves and a shawl too I saw gloves and a shawl um at the Houghton I, last week yeah some uh, some sketches and some fabric samples and uh some information about recreating the white dress um and then we're also going to be um sending some of the um patterns that we used for the for the clothes that were taken um a lot of them taken from real from real clothes we always start with you know something real and then we you know make it our own. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there's a so, lot of like, um, I, in addition to all the scripts, there's also um, these tone books that we created for our own use. At the start of every season, we would create um, a tone book that would give all of us internally and also Apple, we would use them as a presentation to Apple of like, here's what we're seeing for the spa that they go to in season two, um, or here's how Lavinia's costumes are going to look this year. Um, you know, and there's sort of a page of, of, of like mood and vision. I remember a really special one for me is the mood. We had a mood board for episode three in season one, Wild Nights, which is the house party episode. And Jen found these fantastic images of like, I don't know, they were from like Vice Magazine of like hipsters in Williamsburg partying, but we knew that we wanted that kind of vibe, but we needed it to be in, you know, the 1850s. And, um, and so just uh, putting um, like put it, you know, I, I always think just from create creatively speaking, it starts to get easier to make something the more that you can actually see it. And so I just am a huge fan of putting things on walls and, 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 and just st starting to print things out where you can see them. Um, I mean, definitely we would use things like that in our writer's room also, and like even hanging up, pick, hanging up the poems that we were using. Um, and just you know, surrounding ourselves with with like the real the real um, tangible imagery, so that we can like move toward it and make it real. I guess. So one last question, and it's such a, a great one. Though it's also a, a hard one. And then I think our time is up. What 
what do you think Emily Dickinson would think of the show? If Emily's ghost is 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 kind of hovering uh, around right now and has an Apple TV subscription. <laughs> what what's her her response? I mean, I think I think she'd be like, yeah, you got a little bit of it right. You know, yeah, she'd be like, there's a lot more you didn't get. Yeah. And that would and, be impossible to get. And then, yeah. and then I'd be like, well, Emily, I mean, it was kind of about me actually. So <laughs> that would be a good response. That would be no, a great but response. I, I was, I had so, I, the, uh, this past summer, I did visit the museum and did an event there with, with Jane, the executive director and Martha Ackman, who's a Dickinson scholar. And it was, the museum is closed for renovation right now. And, um, but we were doing it over Zoom, of course. And so we were sitting at a table outside of Emily's room at night in a thunderstorm, drinking cocktails and like talking about Emily. And, 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 you know, I just, I really had this moment, like something passed through my body in that. And I, and I was like, I love this. I love this crazy bitch, you know, like, mm -hmm. like Emily Dickinson, like, I don't know. She's just, she's, she's something like her spirit, her force. It is really, really strong. And everyone who goes to the museum goes, feels that. And, 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 you know, like I, 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 I love Emily Dickinson and I, and I hope that our show only just like helps bring the next generation of people to her and everyone always is getting to create their own Emily Dickinson. That's kind of the great thing about her. So that's a wonderful note on which to end and apologies to like the 50 people who asked questions um, when we had a 15 minute Q&A, but um, uh, you should know that the questions are just full of, of, of love and admiration for the show. And thank you all so um, much. Congratulations. For being here. We can't wait for you to see the rest of season three, starting with episode four this week. Cool. <laughs> thank you. Thanks guys. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much. And thank you, Deidre, for moderating. Um, thank you, Otto, for being our Zoom tech. Um, oh. Thank you, Michael Pasternak, for moderating the chat tonight. Um, and thank you, Leslie, for introducing everyone. Bye.